Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back from spring break. Um, today, we're going to focus on cubism and looking at how it cha challenges tradition. We'll look at a few styles that were influenced by cubism as well. And then tomorrow, 112, uh, we'll kind of continue that sort of thought of styles that were heavily influenced by uh, cubism and how they were challenging the traditions of academic painting. Um, I wanted to remind you once again about the AP review sessions. Um, I know that's a lot to juggle with all the other courses that you're taking, um, but they are um, recorded. And so I believe you can go back and watch them if you're interested. Um, I know there's three on Pacific culture that have been posted from before spring break, and then they did them during spring break. Um, the ones for the Pacific culture, even though Pacific isn't in the 250, um, I was told that they did do a lot of comparisons with pieces that are, so it would be a good review if you did get some time to actually do it. So let's go ahead and get, begin. Um, there's me at the MoMA. Um, the Ladies of Avignon is there, and so you get kind of a, a an idea of the scale of it. Um, does anyone know who the artist is who painted this portrait? This is actually a self-portrait of the artist. Does anyone know who it is? Um, this is Pablo Picasso. Um, you've probably seen many portraits of him um, since maybe photographed or painted. Um, and so this was done um, early in his career. He was an artist from um, Spain. Um, from, um, I want to say from Barcelona and he moved to Paris at a very young age, um, hoping to become an artist. Um, and so a lot of his early pieces are what we call the blue period. And so he was an expressionist, um, using blue as a color to exude mood. So what does blue convey? Um, if you look at the painting, you might notice how um, kind of emaciated his face is, how sunken his cheeks are. Uh, when he first got to Paris, he wasn't famous. He was probably impoverished, um, not eating well, not taking very good care of himself. And so the blue was supposed to exude kind of the sadness that he felt, um, this kind of depressive state. So he has many paintings that he did during this blue period. Um, his rose period, you start to see the introductions of some pinks and peaches into it. Um, this is thought to have been the period where he started to fall in love for the very first time. Um, he was kind of a, a womanizer, and so he had many loves or many affairs during his entire lifetime as well as many wives. Um, he did get some very wealthy patrons right off the bat. Um, and so Gertrude Stein was an expatriate American living in Europe. And um, he had her paint. He had, she had him paint this portrait of her. Um, you can see some influence from African art as he was in Paris. He was taking time to visit um, ethnographic museums. So ethnographic museums would be like the Field Museum. They need museums that study other cultures. And he was looking at African masks. Eventually he starts to collect them. Is there any similarities you can see in her facial features that are reminiscent of African masks? You might notice how stylized the eyes are. They're very simplified, how angular and how long the nose is, how exaggerated the brow is how pointy her chin is. It's interesting, it does recall Gertrude Stein, but it's not a you know, photorealistic portrait of her. Here's an example of him young with his collections of African masks and African objects that he started to collect, All right? So let's go ahead and just look at cubism. Um, cubism was a very influential early modern art movement. It really dominated the first half of the 20th century before World War II. It was based on geometric shapes uh, where the shapes are often broken, 
altered, and then reassembled to create abstract forms. It was influenced heavily by people um, collecting African masks, looking at um, masks in the museums, the geometric nature of them. Um, painters like Cezanne, who we talked about already, about how he really was the father of the modern artist. Um, looking at people like Einstein, looking at science of the day and how could art convey really complex concepts like space time, um, quality of reality, that sort of thing. Um, that kind of led to the ability to be able to see things in multiple directions. Like you could mix views, so you could have top, front, side, bottom, uh, three quarter views all in the same artwork. Um, very similar to like Moybridge in the photos and how he would show action. Uh, we also have the invention of things like x-rays and radar so people could start to see through things and um, be able to understand what things look like and how can we show structure. And there were many different types of cubism. Um, there's facet or analytical cubism, um, synthetic cubism, as well as collage cubism. And collage really is just a fancy version of synthetic. So that lead, leads us to our um, Ladies of Avignon, our number 126 by Pablo Picasso. We already did a comparison when we were in the African unit, so you do already know some things about this painting. Um, a little bit of context. Um, you, Matisse, and Picasso were in Paris at the very same time. So remember Matisse was that famous fob artist and um, he was probably the most famous artist in Paris during this time. So Picasso was kind of like, he worked with other artists, but also he's very competitive in nature. And so he was trying to make a name for himself. And so when he would see images like the joy of life, he would try to actively rebel against them. So by looking at these two paintings, can you compare how the styles are radically different from each other? What is their mood? Um, look at the color choices. Think about the style. Right? So when we look at work like Picasso, we have to think about how his work was revolutionary. Like, how is it different than the work we just saw by Matisse? He really is compressing the space. It almost feels claustrophobic. Notice how the edges of this painting and the proximity to, to the figures, um, there isn't a lot of breathing space for them. It's almost like where it's a window looking in on a room. And it almost has a feel of like claustrophobic. Whereas if we go back to this painting, right, it's very open, it's exterior, it's very joyous. There's space given to a lot of the, the works. Um, the colors are more muted and mixed. They're not as vivid as you see here. And then uh, most of the rest of the slides um, that we have here is dealing with um, kind of the aggressive angular nature of how he composed um, or how he decided, decided to convey the body. So in a way they're aggressively crude. There's a lot of sharp angles. Um, there's a lot of simplification. The bodies are no longer classical sort of poses with classical smooth sensual surfaces. Um, they're not in that typical um, Venus of Urbino, um, La Grande Adelesque. Um, even Olympia, right? This is a departure from Olympia. Um, the bodies are very angular, jagged, and they almost have like a fractured sort of quality to them. So when we look at the subject matter, what is he depicting? Um, it is very similar to Olympia. And so what was Olympia? Who was she in this painting? Yeah, these are five prostitutes in a brothel from the red light district in Barcelona. He wrote extensively about this. This is probably the very first sort of cubist painting um, ever made. And so he did write a lot about it in his journals. And so he 
um, would have frequented them in his youth, probably also in Paris. And so it would be a place of pleasure, but also of um, being very like kind of scared, you know, like sexually transmitted diseases were prevalent. Um, you know, you could be robbed. And so they were very dangerous places. And so he was trying to convey that kind of dangerous sort of quality of his youth in this painting. Um, he had many traditions. Um, he knew art history. Um, he studied it. He um, maybe looked at, this is a Ong's painting on the right here. And he mimicked some of the poses from some of these famous paintings um, by Ong's from the previous century. Um, he really was playing and manipulating form. So he was manipulating space. How is he conveying different views at the same time? How is he manipulating space? Um, when we look at this painting, I wish I had, was able to use my pointer, but we'll try to use the cursor as best as we can. When you look at it, it's almost as if we're looking at the scene from at least two different vantage points. Let's start with just the center. These two ladies in the center appear to be reclining. They're laying on top of a bed. So here we have the sheets, right? We have the, the sheets covering up part of their body. And so they appear that from like we're a bird kind of hovering above the bed. Right, so it's this top sort of aerial view. But then we have this figure over here appear, appears to like be pulling back a curtain and walking into a room. So like how do you walk into a room when you're looking at it from this angle? So here he's decided to use a traditional sort of like side front view as well as using it for the figures um, that's seated on the bottom right as well as the one that is in profile on the left. And so he's mixing these top and side views um, together. And then if you really pay attention, he's also doing that with the facial features, um, almost like Egyptian painting in a way. And so for the eyes, we have our eyes in front views, right? So we see the all, you know, the two eyes, but then we see a profile nose and a frontal mouth. And so he's combining and shifting our different angles here. Um, he also, right, was very much influenced by how we paint. Cubism is often thought to be a very formal painting style. So if you remember when we talked about formalism versus expressionism, formalism is about the act of painting. And so he would have looked at people like Cezanne and how is his work formal? What is he trying to emphasize here? A lot of people look at cubism and think it really is about manipulating the space. It's about that kind of angular sort of fractional, fra fractional space. How do I distort reality? How do I rearrange? How do I compose? It's about composition. It's about brushwork. It's about the fractured space. It's not necessarily about let's depict five prostitutes, but we do get some emotional content as well. Um, I think that that is an issue that we often have with things is that maybe there was an intention, but underlining now with some time and space, we do have some interpretations. And so it goes back to what his writings that I know many of you guys comment about on your essay questions about how he once had an image of a doctor in this piece and he cut it out. Um, this idea of this fear of catching some you know, sexual transmitted diseases from this woman. There is an emotional sort of concept to this as well. Um, also kind of going back, we know that he wasn't just influenced by history. He was also influenced by African masks. And so he painted in a very angular sort of distorted style. And you can really see that in the figures on the right, as well as the figure on the left. But even these figures here in the aerial view come from the Iberian Peninsula. So on Spain, you know, there was groups of people who lived there um, for centuries for millennia um, that were precursors to contemporary modern style. And so we actually have ancient like Iberian details 
that were angular, right? They were simplified. They were stylized. And he was very influenced by those ancient Spanish cultures, as well as the angularness that he saw in his collection, as well as the museums um, that were inspired by African art. So um, at the same time that Picasso was experimenting with Cubism, George Brock was also doing that as well. They knew each other. They were friends. They would go back and forth between each other's studios quite often. And so um, he was also working in Cubism. And so he has a lot of scenes that are based on like nature, outdoor sort of landscape. So here we have a city with trees. Um, can you tell what this one is? Yeah, this is like a port city. These are ships in the foreground. Um, can you tell what this is an image of? Yeah, this is a still life. And so C Picasso and Brock, a lot of their early analytical cubist paintings look very, very similar. So when you go to a museum, sometimes you really have to look at the name on it before you actually know which artist made it. And so Brock was picking very traditional subject matter, still life material, and really analyzing space. This is one of those like more unemotional sort of um, styles of cubism. And so um, here's kind of a comparison between analytical versus uh, synthetic cubism. With analytical cubism, we're really breaking apart the form. So we are creating, um, we are making imagery from different angles, and it's all very painterly. Um, it's typically kind of monochromatic. With synthetic cubism, it can be collaged like this one, but it also could be painted as well. And it could be taking geometric shapes and forms and arranging them in a way to create form. So analytical kind of breaks apart form, synthetic kind of builds form. And I think as you see more examples, you'll be able to understand this a little bit more. So characteristics of analytical. Um, you might want to take some good notes on this because this is going to be um, things that you could write on your um, in your notes for George Brock's um, image that's in the 250. So analytical cubism breaks apart an object to try to analyze it. And so artists would shatter. They pick apart. They rearrange the imagery. Um, they try to show an object from multiple views at the same time. Um, thinking about how your brain processes. Um, we see time. We see things manipulate. We see things change. Uh, we can move around an object and see it from different vantage points in order to understand what it actually is. Um, this can also convey a sense of movement. Think about Moybridge's art and how um, you can create multiple images to create a sense of motion. Um, analytical cubism often merges foreground and background and has a very limited palette. So it is often like monochromatic, one color plus tints and shades. So either the artworks are all kind of in grays, all in browns, or all in greens. That's very common of analytical cubism. Um, very minimal texture. Um, there's a lot of brushwork in cubism, analytical cubism, but not necessarily trying to create great fur or hair or smooth skin, that sort of texture. Um, analytical cubism is often has very sort of common subject matter. Their subject matter was not radical or avant-garde in, in the least. So they were picking things that were very simple, things like still life materials. So very common things like musical instruments, sheet music, newspapers, bottles, fruits, tables. Um, they would do a lot of portraits, um, landscapes. Okay, so in this one, you might be able to tell what this is. This is a still life with bottles and fish. Right? Um, and that leads us to The Portuguese by George Brock, our number 130. So can you tell what the subject matter is for the Portuguese? This is based on a Portuguese museum that he saw playing in 
a bar in Marseille. And so if you look really carefully, you can find the musician. So if we look up here at the very top, you can see his nose, right? You can see his eye, see his mouth, right? Um, maybe this is his hair. Kind of looks like he's wearing a chef hat. Always cracks me up. And then we look down and maybe some shoulders here, chest, arm. And then here we have his guitar, right? We have his guitar. Um, so let's look at some of those characteristics. Once again, notice how the color is all monochromatic. This one is made out of what color? Yep, made out of browns. And we have light and dark versions of those browns, right? You can see how he uses lines to kind of fracture the space. If you look here in the eye area, it's almost like we see the eye once, twice, maybe even three times, right? So we have multiple views, multiple images of the same thing, right? Got our nose and our mouths. The mouth is kind of like a frontal. The nose is in profile, right? We have um, the change in value once we hit a line. You see evident brush stroke. Notice how it's very painterly, so it's visible. It's not trying to recreate, um, you know, texture in, in to say the least. So he's really analyzing, distorting the form. So here's all those different things. Oh yeah, he's using a very common sort of subject matter of a portrait as well. Um, they were using very common subject matter, but they were also um, really interested in um, trying some new techniques as well. So if you look at the background, right, so they kind of merge together, you'll notice that there's some lettering. So with lettering, they were often using stencils. So they would use wax stencils and they would paint in the text. Often the text somehow related to the text from like maybe the music that they were playing or the name of the bar. So somehow they were informative about what the painting was all about. I think when you look at the Portuguese, you might be able to make a comparison about how his work was influenced by Cezanne. Um, this would be another really good example of comparis comparison and seeing how one is influenced by the other. Right, so very sort of blocky, very geometric use of those evident brush strokes to kind of create some form, distort and separate form. So it's all about the act of painting. It's about manipulating form. It's about manipulating space. It's about the act of painting. Here's Mao Jolie, which is based on a very famous um, song of the day. I think this is a Picasso, yeah. So here you can see the difference, right? Between Brock, Picasso, they look very, very similar, right? So it's hard to be able to tell the difference, right? This is Picasso portrait. He did many uh, portraits of the art dealers of the day. So this is one of an art dealer. This is another of a other art dealer, right? Um, this is kind of a combo piece by Picasso. It's kind of a um, an analytical, but has some characteristics of synthetic. Um, he used a round canvas and that is actual rope. So he's adding imagery that's actual rope on the outside. And then this chair caning, the stuff that you normally see for upholstery, that's actually faux. So that's like a, almost like a wallpaper or think about like scrapbook paper that kind of looks like something else. He glued that to the surface. So this is paper that looks like um, this chair caning and then all of this other stuff is painted on the edge. Right. Um, this is really good example of synthetic cubism or collage cubism. So they would use things like wine bottle labels and newspapers and sheet music, and they would collage and glue them down. Collage actually needs cut paper. Um, it's typically glued, and they would rearrange to create form, so cutting and distorting. Um, and then they would often go back in and work into it. So some of them do have evidence of paint or charcoal or other medias as well.
right? So synthetic cubism is the building of composition from simpler forms. Um, they are often done in collage, but they don't have to be. Um, we could paint a square, paint a shape, or paint a form. Um, sometimes the materials bring their own meaning. So like the sheet music might recall, oh, that beautiful song that was popular in the day. Um, and sometimes but there is more use of cover, color. So they're not as monochromatic. So here you can sort of see um, wallpaper, sheet music. Um, this is maybe a rubbing of wood or a paper of false wood. You can see how they were really uh, playing with found materials. Um, this is made out of wood, but it kind of looks like it's made out of cardboard. So he did some sculptures as well. This is all Picasso, by the way. Picasso again. Um, this is a clarinet as well as I think a lute. Uh, mandolin. So like a guitar-like um, musical instrument. Right? And um, kind of continuing with Picasso. Um, Picasso made a real uh, made a name for himself, and he became quite famous with the invention of cubism. And he lived a very long time. He was very prolific, made a lot of paintings. Um, his styles changed a lot over the years. Like when he was first developing in France, the Blue Period really wasn't his first style. He was painting an impressionist, post-impressionist style. He did um, realism. He did expressionism, and then he'll do things like surrealism and cubism, and so on and so forth as well. And so um, he started to get kind of frustrated with cubism because it was hard for him to create some sort of emotional concept. And so he felt like he could explore with synthetic cubism, convey a little bit more emotion and meaning with it. Um, the Three Musicians is a really good example of his synthetic qualities or his synthetic cubism and what he became really known for. And so um, it's kind of a merging of those two styles together. But you can see how he's building form. He's not fracturing and, and separating, manipulating space anymore. He's using sort of simple, sort of geometric shapes and patterns to create his imagery. So he's painting like this, and he's really frustrated. So he starts to paint kind of these more realistic sort of scenes. They're not perfectly realism, but more realistic scenes. Because he's really trying to show... Um, more emotive, so more emotional sort of content in his artwork. So he's painting very realistically, um, making these sort of colossal, monumental female figures. And what starts to happen is you start to see his synthetic cubism start to have some more emotional sort of quality. So he starts to merge these things together. We start to have the invention of surrealism by the surrealist artist. He's starting to get influenced by that. And you start to see emotional content in his, his, his works. These are two separate pieces. So let me separate them here um, in my slide. Um, and you'll notice that there's a sense of joy in this one, right? This one is like contemplation, right? So he's able to start to put some more emotional quality. And the reason for that is that he was manipulating and experimenting with realism, realism and investigating emotion. So he wasn't just sticking to what he knew. He was really trying to develop himself as an artist. Um, he was a notorious womanizer, and a lot of his portraits or, or that he made were of women who he had affairs with. So you might see this very pretty little girl, and he she becomes part of a in a relationship with Picasso, and then she looks like this at the end, right? He had a way of kind of ruining um, the women in his life. Um, probably one of the most important paintings of his career is Guernica. And um, I would highly recommend watching a video on Guernica. Um, this one, oh, it's rather short. We'll go ahead and watch this here. I'm sure there's a lot, um, there's one on smart history as well.
So when we look at Guernica, um, he made it um, for the world exhibition. And so it was displayed in the Spanish pavilion. He was living in France during this time. And um, what you notice is that he chose to go back to that monochromatic painting style um, from several decades before. And he intentionally did it. So if you look really carefully, especially in the horse-like image, it kind of looks like text. And so you have to think about, he was getting most of his news from black and white film reels, as well as newspapers. So he intentionally wanted this to read like a newspaper documenting the horrific um, oppression of Franco um, government during the Spanish War, but also his support from his allies in Italy and in Germany. So this is before World War II um, that the Spanish War was taking place, the Civil War. And so um, I think the video did a really great job of kind of going through um, but he really wanted to illuminate these atrocities. So there's a lot of representations of light. There's this lady sort of like Liberty opening the door and illuminating with light shining in. There's this wicked surrealist eye with a light bulb that is shining light. And you can see that light and that fractured sort of angular style that illuminates the setting. Um, so, we're going to zip through a few more examples of things that were influenced by Cubism. Um, and so in um, Paris especially, there was a style called Orpheism. And Orpheism it was basically Cubism with color. It's like analytical Cubism with color. And there was some uh, non-objective art being produced during this time, so art that doesn't look like real things. Um, the Delaney's were um, really good examples of this. This is Robert Delaney's image of the um, Eiffel Tower. It almost looks like it's like coming alive, right? So that fractured analyzing of space makes it feel like it's almost like walking across the canvas, but very bright sort of luminous red color. Um, here's another example of his um, painting. So this is Robert Delaney. Um, this one is about aviation. Um, so you still see Paris, see Eiffel Tower back there, but can you find elements of aviation, right? We've got a plane, another plane, propeller over here, right? Something's going on over here. And then maybe the circular fractured sort of space represents the action of those propellers as they move and lift the planes. Um, Sonia Delaney was his wife, and she painted a lot of works too, but she was a very famous uh, fabric designer. And so she designed um, a um, Citron, a very famous, let me make sure, am I right? It's a Citron? Oh, yeah. Uh, car. She actually uh, helped design a car for women. And so the paint um, was designed, or the paint job on the car was designed by her, and then as well as the driving outfit. So you would wear this outfit as you were riding in your car. Here's some examples of some of her fabric um, designs. Um, purism is also comes from cubism, and it has kind of a machine sort of aesthetic to him. Um, it's very much clean and precise, like machinery. Um, Robert Leger, um, Leger is it looks like that in English, um, was very famous for this. So he um, did this street scene. You see a lot of emblems of street life. You see roads, you see signage, right? You see posts. Um, and so kind of this fracturing and analyzing of space, but once again, with color. Here's his nudes reclining. Uh, futurism was a German style that was very much in inspired by cubism. And it really wanted to show the motion of time and space. It really praised industrialization. So the modern age, steel, speed, virtues um, that were kind of revolutionary during the day. Um, some of the futurist artworks are quite interested, interesting, but there was kind of a dark side to it as well. Um, this is during fascist time period in Italy. And so they were after, often rallying about the virtues of violence and war. A lot of these artists thought that if we, um, or thought that if humans built these machines, that they could get rid of lessers. Um, so kind of horrible sort of concepts. 
Um, but a lot of the artists were just inspired by cubism. And so they'd start to make artworks that were based on light, color, sound, and speed. Um, they were much inspired by Filippo Marinetti's um, teachings mm-hmm. and um, believe that machines were good, that they would help with prosperity. Um, so this one is actually from your textbook. Can you tell what this is an image of? This is a speeding train with arm like uh, soldiers on the top. So this is like an aerial view of a train going farther back from us. And then you see armed soldiers with rifles pointing out um, to the hillsides. So kind of the essence of war and violence. Um, here's the bicyclist. This is Bocchini. Let me see. Yeah, Bocchini. So this is the bicycle list, excuse me. And so you see it's not about the bicycle, it's about the action of the pedaling and moving through space. Uh, very much an analytical sort of cubist inspired piece um, with some um, color, right? Here's the soccer player, that's my husband. Um, this is also at the MoMA, right? Um, this is the city rises, so that kind of idea of industrialization is kind of represented by this, these big giant horses, like um, horsepower, right? Kind of a sense of aggressiveness, sort of violence, right? Um, this is an example of a futurist painting, and this is actually um, Bocchini as well, so the painter Bocchini, and he uh, was inspired by the victory of Sama thrice. He said that a roaring car was much more beautiful than it, that this was too much rooted in classical sort of tradition. And so when you look at this figure, you can see where it looks like it's kind of moving in the wind. It's almost like the skin is kind of peeling off from it. It's kind of fractured and sort of distorted, but it has this kind of machine quality to it. Um, this one's at the Art Institute, and this is by Mar- um, uh, Duchamp's brother. Um, what's his first name? Raymond Duchamp. Um, and this one is um, based on a large horse, and it feels like horsepower, doesn't it? So instead of just looking like a horse, what mechanical parts of a machine can you find? See, it's where it looks like pistons and lovers, right? Um, Cubofuturism um, is kind of a combo. And this was a Russian art movement that was based on industrialization. And so it would kind of try to combine. Um, you can see that it has a lot of influence in cubism and those bright sort of colors um, of, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, uh, futurists and so on, and Orpheism. Okay, so that's where we're going to stop for today.